Welcome to Living on the Edge. My name's Chip Ingram, and you've joined us in a series called Experiencing God's Dream for Your Marriage. You know, I've married a lot of people as a pastor over the last 20 or 25 years, and there's two pictures that really come to mind. The first picture is the joy, the throwing of the rice, the people having fun at the reception, and the other picture is the tears, the counseling room, the separation, the filing for divorces. You know, all of us long I mean to be loved and to give love and to be intimate. But what went wrong? What are the barriers? Why is it so difficult? In today's program, we're going to look at the barriers that are sabotaging marriages, and then we're going to learn God's solutions. You know, if you've given up on your marriage or you want to make sure yours doesn't go down the tube, you can't afford not to stay with me. I was uh, sitting in a chair, something like this, my uh, wedding was six weeks away, and Teresa and I, I, it is a confession, we really do love a good cup of coffee, and uh, often decaf, of course, later in the day. But we were planning our wedding, and we were so excited. And I'd like you, if you could, in your mind's eye, to just put it in reverse. For some of you, you know, it's like 40 years ago you were doing that, and for others it was 40 days ago. But can you go back and think about all the excitement? And, you know, once you got through the hassles of planning the wedding and it was getting kind of close. And then I'd like you, if you would, to dream, just, just in reverse, sort of a dream in your mind of what were you hoping? What were you expecting? I mean, when you walked down that aisle and when you said, I do, and in most cases, friends and family, And these hopes and dreams, I mean, for some of you, since you were tiny little girls, and for us guys thinking, you know, I'm going to find that right woman someday, what did you think it was going to be like? Do you remember? I mean, mean, what what did you expect? What what were you hoping? Uh, My my wife and I look back, and I would say the day we got married has to be one of the top maybe two, three days, and maybe number one of all the experiences we've ever had. Well, we came back from our honeymoon a little bit early because uh, one of her uh, dad's brothers got sick and was in the hospital, and they asked us to come and pray and help him. It was an amazing thing. We saw a miraculous recovery, and and so we came back to this empty uh, apartment, and, you know, our wedding presents were there, and and we unpacked a few of them, and, and we didn't have any premarital counseling. I don't know why. I'm not sure they did it in those days. All I can tell you is, it was about a picture. And we were trying to get this picture over the fireplace. I can't tell you whether she wanted it right or left or high or low or whatever, but she said something, and then I said something, and she said something, and then I said something else, and then she said something, I said something. And I mean, in about 15 minutes, it was like, I didn't think I could have feelings like this for Teresa. I mean, we did not have any big fights before we got married. Uh, If anything, we were a little overly spiritual. And we prayed together and sang together and read the Bible together, but expectations and finances and kids and practical living and how it was going to work, we didn't really talk about that stuff. We thought if you really love one another, all that will just work out. And all i got to tell you is I've only been married now, let's see, I'm thinking back in my mind, maybe it's like seven or nine days max because we had to come back early. And I got so mad, and she got so mad, and then I got so mad, I just slammed the door and I left, and I got my little green Volkswagen, and I got in the Volkswagen, and I'm driving around Fairmont, West Virginia, and I go up into the mountains, and I look down on that little house in part of our apartment, I thought, man, did I mess up? Did I, 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 I think I married the wrong person. It's too late. What have I done? I thought, how can you have feelings like this? I've never been so angry in my life. She makes me nuts. I mean, I love her, I love her, I love her. Ugh. I can't believe she said that to me. Sweet, little, kind, loving, mm, Teresa. There's something in there I didn't know about. How come I didn't find out about this earlier? I was livid. And then I was scared. Because I thought, whoa, uh... Is this, I mean, is the rest of my life going to be like this? I mean, this was like a lion came out of the closet. And, of course, she's home crying. And, and get this, it's about a picture. Are you kidding me? It's about a picture. And now neither of us can remember what the picture was about. What went wrong? 
And that's what we want to talk about. Every, you've had dreams. I've had dreams. You've, if you've been married more than about six weeks, you, you've found out that it's not exactly what you thought it was going to be, right? And if you've been married a long time, you've realized there's a lot of hard stuff that comes in marriage. And a lot of people, when it gets hard, they give up. Because they think, they think something's wrong or I married the wrong person instead of this is normal. My experience is when you can define a problem, it's about 50% solved. Okay? I mean, if you can really figure out this is the problem, you're about 50% of the way there of understanding, oh, okay, now I know how to respond. And what I want to talk about in this session is what went wrong or what are the barriers to intimacy in marriage? Now, in your notes, you're going to see I have four premises. They're taken from Scripture and a lot of research I've done over the years. Premise number one, we all have legitimate needs and longings. The need to have open, honest, vulnerable, completing relationships, accepting relationships. Relationships that are affirming. I long to have those, most especially with my wife, but we all long those. Second premise, God originally designed our spouse to be a major tool in his hands to meet those needs and longings. And notice there's a line under the word major, not the only tool. Your mate cannot come through for you. They can't solve your problems. But a major tool, a significant way, an agent of grace is God wants the person sitting next to you in this room right now to be a major source of meeting the deepest longings and desires that you have. Third premise. The fall or sin, Genesis chapter 3, short-circuited man's relationship with God, his mate, and this world. Okay, sin entered the world, and we have these longings, and literally it's like the wiring now is short-circuited so that premise number four becomes the reality. What was once the most natural relational response, other-centered grace-giving, is now the most unnatural of responses requiring supernatural enablement and hard work to achieve. And so notice I put a picture on the bottom, and the picture is we have God's blueprint, right? We got the blueprint. God's at the top, equilateral triangle. We want to have a relationship with God whose desire is for oneness with one another. But notice what's been added. There's now a barrier between us and God. Something happened. We're not in fellowship with God now. There's a barrier, and that barrier is sin. And now there's another barrier. There's a barrier between one another. See, this idea that I had, I can still remember sitting on this chair, sipping my coffee, this beautiful blonde who I loved with all my heart, who we prayed together, we read scripture together, was doing ministry together, we had these dreams together. Everyone else was going to have problems, but see, they didn't do it the way we did it, and they don't know Teresa, and she's sweeter and lovelier and kinder and more wonderful than any other woman in the whole world, and I was completely deluded. And I'm just going to be this man for her. It's all going to work out great, and we couldn't even handle hanging a picture. And I mean, I had feelings of rejection and hurt and wound and pain and anger like I didn't think I could even have. And that's because when we were hanging that picture, my way is the way to do it. How I see it is how it is. Your difference isn't different. It's wrong. This is it. And so once that was just the symptom, we begin to attack one another. That's what sin does. But it's not the only barrier. See, most of us think, here's, here's that myth. Here's the myth, and it's, it's you, every movie you watch reinforces it. Every uh, little book that talks about how wonderful an idyllic thing is, every TV show says this. If you really love one another, it'll all work out. Loving another person is the most natural thing. You'll be kind and other-centered. If you really love one another, it'll be easy and it'll be great. That is is the farthest thing from the truth. If you really love one another, it will require supernatural enablement from God and an amazing amount of hard work. And it is the grace of God that teaches us to say no to worldliness and lustly passions and instead to live sober, self-disciplined lives of caring for other people. And so I want you to pull out your pen and I want you to roll up your sleeves and I'm gonna walk through the four barriers 
so that you can identify what they are. And the first one is the biggie. I'll spend the most time on the barrier of sin. And, and as you open, and what I want you to know is this barrier of sin distorts the others too. The others are normal barriers. I mean, there's differences between men and women. There's differences in terms of, uh, you know, just our personalities. But that barrier of sin is going to tilt things to make even those things negative or bad. Let's look at barrier number one, and it's spiritual barrier of sin, shame, and selfishness. And if you would, open your Bibles again to uh, Genesis chapter 3. And I would love to spend a bit more time than we will, but let me give you an overview of how the barrier occurred, the impact that it had then, and the impact that it has now. Beginning in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord has made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say, You must not eat of any tree in the garden? Uh, the woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it. Two quick observations. The first attack in sin entering in the world is in God's word. The first attack is you can't trust God's word about what's real, what's right, what's true, and how life works. The second error, the first theological error of mankind was to add to God's word. God never said, and not touch it. And when you add to God's word, and then, you know what? Can you imagine what happened when she took the piece of fruit? She's touching it. She's not dead. Well, all of a sudden, it raises, well, I guess the rest of it's not true. We go on. He goes on to say in verse 4, You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good from evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it, and she ate it. The first attack is on God's word. The second attack is what? It's on his character. God doesn't have your best in mind. Don't do it God's way. <laughs> I mean, don't, don't handle your money God's way. He's trying to keep you from all this stuff. You can just put it on time now. You know, you can have your house full of all this furniture and no payments till 2020, right? Or for 19, if you can't sleep, for 1995, there's something that you can take two pills with 30 pounds overnight. There's an easy way to do everything. Every command of God is guardrails because he loves you so much to protect you from getting something second rate or something that would hurt you. And the very first temptation, what do we have? God doesn't have your best in mind. And the temptation always comes in the same three areas. It was for Eve, it was for Adam, it was for Jesus, and it is for us. She saw lust of the eyes. The food, lust of the flesh. It would make her wise, the pride of life. And those are going to be the strategies of shortcuts that Satan's going to use in this world system that we live in to pull you away and pull your marriage away from what God wants for you. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And you might jot in your Bible, the first passive male. And you know what? Isn't it interesting that when we get to the New Testament and God begins to assign culpability to the fall, it doesn't say Eve fell. Eve was deceived. Adam went in with his eyes wide open. Adam had an issue of loyalty, and Adam saw all the same things, and he chose to disobey. Now let's find out what happens. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. N notice psychologically what's happened. The first human experience of self-consciousness occurs. They're aware of me, what's going on with me. They realize they were naked. Their response, shame. After the shame, they hide. And that has been the response of human beings to God and one another ever since. We're self-conscious. How am I coming off? Do people like me? Am I affirmed? What do they think? How's it going? When I look down deep and I see me, I don't measure up. When I don't measure up, oh, I don't want to be rejected. So I will hide myself. And I can hide myself behind power or money or clothes or looks or surgery or power. And I can hide myself behind a paper or ESPN 
or a magazine or children. And so the process starts of this is how we begin to relate to one another. And you just have different fig leaves on than they had on. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they noticed the hiding isn't just from one another. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And now we get a rhetorical question. Obviously, God knows all that has happened, but he wants them to learn. So he gives them a diagnostic question. He goes, where are you? And Adam answers, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. If you have permission in your Bible, circle the word afraid, naked, and hid. It's how we relate to God, and that's how we relate to one another. I'm afraid. Why I'm afraid? Something's wrong with me now. I'm insecure. I don't measure up. I've done something wrong. There's both legitimate guilt and shame. I was afraid. And so what did he do? He hid. And the average couple spends a lot of energy hiding from one another and hiding from God. Somehow, somehow, you know, it's, it isn't amazing, the human psyche, this all-knowing God, we play all these games thinking, you know, he won't really see, right? You know, <laughs> he, he won't really see what's going on. And so a lot of us have a very significant struggle in prayer, don't we? We have a hard time concentrating. We have a time really opening up because what you know is when you have significant, prolonged, relaxed time where you open your heart to God, what's he going to do? He's going to convict you of sin and righteousness and judgment. But we wrongly think it's so he can shame us and put us down. And instead, it's the arms of a loving God who says, let me show you some things that are going to put a barrier in relationships and a barrier with me. And the word confess means, why don't you come and be honest and real and agree with me so I can put my arms around you and forgive you and cleanse you so that we can remove that barrier. He goes on to say, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Now, now I want you to just get there with me, okay, mentally? Let's just get there. They've been through this. They've got some fig leaves on. Their, their relationship has really changed. The, it, this is a lot bigger than the picture over the fireplace. But, 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 but they've had that relational click where they were in sync. Now they're out of sync. Now God comes. And, you know, Eve, I don't know how long they've, you know, been in the garden, but we, we have a general idea that they've had a great, wonderful relationship without sin. And now Eve is going to get her first experience of what happens when things go wrong. Is your man going to step up for you? Can you trust him? Is it safe to bear your soul? And if you make a mistake, is he going to be there for you? Ladies, I want you in your mind's eye to imagine what it would feel like when God of the universe ask your husband this question and you listen to this response the man said the woman that you put here with me she gave me some of the fruit of the tree and I ate it sin shame fear hiding blame shifting it's not my fault you know by the way you know what I was doing fine it was a little lonely but me and the animals we were doing fine I don't know what happened that this woman that you gave me she's the problem Probably not going to open up to a man like that, are you? And she's a quick study. So God then begins the inter interrogation with her, and then the Lord said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat of the dust of it all the days of your life. And he goes on to say, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. And then we get this messianic promise that comes out. We can't develop. But he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And then to the woman he said, I'll greatly increase your pains in childbearing with the pain that you give birth to the children. Your desire, you might circle that word, will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. So here, here we have it. Isn't it interesting? What's the problem? The man says it's the woman. What's the problem, woman? It's the serpent. And kind of... And by the way, who makes that serpent? Who made these animals anyway? See, ultimately, who do we blame? God. God, this is your problem. Now, what I want you to hear is God is going to give three curses, one on the serpent we've heard, one on the woman, and then as you read the text, one on the man. The curses are an act of grace. The curses are the kind gentleness of a heavenly father who knows 
If a woman could have relational connection and get her longings filled in an easy way, she would need God. The curses help her understand. She wants to be relationally connected. And you women know, I mean, like no one can know, but you women, the joy of giving birth to a child and the extraordinary pain. And every time, that's the fruit, but boy, there's the process. And this word for desire, it has the idea of, of, of being in control over your husband. See, a woman is afraid, so what a woman does is she wants to control things. And she does it a lot of different ways. She wants to control environment, she wants to control things, and she's going to have this dire, desire for her husband. But she wants to rule over him, and God says, but he's going to rule over you. So those desires that are blocked will bring levels of increasing frustration that God hopes that one day, out of his mercy, a woman will say, you know something, I, life's just too hard. I just can't make this on my own. And she'll realize she needs a savior and a deliverer and a redeemer. And a man will keep trying and keep trying and keep trying. I've got to make an impact. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And <gasps> then the stock market fails. Oh, brother. I'm going to cut. I'm going to make this beautiful yarn. Now the weeds come up. And no matter how, there's always weeds in a man's life. No matter how hard you try, how hard you work, how many degrees you get, how much money you make, how good you are at athletics, how good a musician you are, there's always going to be weeds in your life, and there's always junk. And you just feel like, well, I'm over the next hill then, over the next hill then. And at some point in time, you wake up and smell the roses, and you realize you're, you're never, ever going to do it without tons of pain. And God gave that curse to us as men to say, you were never intended to live like this. I'm going to frustrate you to the point where you come in dependency upon me and realize only through my supernatural power and my forgiveness and my strength can you live out this life because there's a new barrier. It's a fallen world. You know, it's, it's like the world got cancer. It's like there was a coup. There was a cosmic conflict. This world isn't like this anymore. It's tilted this way. And so living out this life is always going to be difficult and painful. Now, notice what he says after he disciplines the man. Verse 21, then the Lord, this act of grace. He says, verse 21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. He sheds blood as a prefiguring of what will happen, and then he covers their shame. Isn't that awesome? He forgives them. There's always a price tag to forgiveness, and this foreshadows the great forgiveness of Christ. And so an animal must die. And the word covering here, we get our same word for atonement. He's going to do something that will cover their sin and cover their shame. And then the Lord God said, now the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord banished him from the garden to work on the ground from which he was taken. And he drove the man out and placed him on the east side of the Garden of Eden, and then he put this cherubim. It's this huge, powerful, I mean, I've never seen one personally, but the definitions I get are the most powerful angels with this flaming sword and another act of grace. You never can get back in here where the state that you're in in this fallen state could become permanent. And all the rest of Scripture, really all of Scripture, is you have a reality that goes up to Genesis chapter 3, and at Genesis chapter 3, we start a parenthesis. And you go all the way through all of life and all of Scripture until you get to Revelation chapter 20. And all of life is one big parenthesis. And then in 20 and 21, all of God's reigning in a perfect environment with people that he loves comes to fruition. But you and I get to live in Genesis 3 up to Revelation 19 or a little bit of 20. Your marriage is always going to be hard. E forever. Because you are married to a selfish person who wants their way. Now, they can, they can get sophisticated and, you know, learn a lot of verses and God changes things in significant ways. But at the core of the flesh of us as human beings, I want my way. At the core of my being, I want my wife to fulfill my needs on my terms. The barrier, first and foremost, is spiritual. The answer is grace. The answer is grace. The answer is, I can't do this. The answer is, I need someone to save me. I need someone to remove the barrier from me and God, and I need someone to remove the barrier from me and my wife. I need to have open access supernatural power. I need to be covered with his blood. I need to be forgiven. I need his spirit deposited in me, and then I need the strength and the power to give my mate what they don't deserve. What I don't want to give when they don't really deserve to get it from me and to pay a real cost 
whether I get anything back or not. Only grace does that. The second barrier is psychological barrier. And as you listen to that, these are our personality differences. And, but as you, as you listen to this, I just want you to remember, this spiritual barrier so colors everything that, boy, I'll, I'll tell you, it makes all these others, it just taints them. Psychological barrier is our personality differences. I mean, men, women, they're different, but just people are different, aren't they? I mean, example, there's introverts and extroverts. I mean, some people go to a party and want to meet everybody, and someone goes to a party, finds a corner with one or two other people, and they spend four hours there, and they come home, oh, that was an awesome party. And if you're an extrovert, you're going, how could that be an awesome party? You sat in the corner with two other people. What a bummer. You know, you're high five and everything. Hey, Jim, Bobby, hey, good to see you. Good to, you know, right? Now, that's not a good or a bad you know, an extrovert needs to get around people to get refreshed. Oh, man, I need to get with my friends. An introvert goes, give me two days alone. Turn off the voicemail. Turn off the email. Unplug the phone. I just need to be. And then the energy comes back. Now, there's all kind of tests, whether it's Myers-Briggs, MMPI, DIST tests. You can discover what these are, but the answer is understanding. The answer is understanding. It's getting, oh, we're different. Let's understand it. The differences aren't bad. But you need to figure out that you really are different. And you know what? It takes time. I wish you had my notes in front of you. Because God's blueprint for marriage has an equilateral triangle. And it's a man and a woman. And as we get closer to God, we get closer to one another. And in my notes, I have a barrier between the man and the woman. And I have a barrier between God and man. And that barrier is sin. Until sin is removed, until you get right with God, can I tell you? You can have a decent relationship, but until you get right with God based on the gift of God's grace through Jesus Christ, you'll never have the marriage God designed for you to have. So can I tell you this? I don't know where you're at spiritually, believer, unbeliever, walking with God, not walking with God. If you want a great relationship, cry out to God. Find a Bible teaching church. Open your Bible and say, God, please help me. He'll always answer that prayer.